Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker Jed Hornbeek. I got my introduction to Jed's work on Instagram when scrolling for Bowie's and was immediately drawn to his modern machined take on classic fixed blade knives. Then I started to see his knives featured in the videos of some of the most trusted voices of the bladesphere, Scab of Choir Boys Cutlery and Billy of Apex Alchemy Chief among them. After seeing what these knives were capable of, uh, I have a whole new respect. Jed Hornbeak knives aren't just easy on the eyes, but they'll cut, stab, and chop till kingdom come. We'll find out how this passion for blending the classic with the contemporary leads to some of the most exciting fixed blades out there right now. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download this podcast to your favorite podcast app. Also, you can help support the show by joining Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to head on over to theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon or scan the QR code on the screen. Again, that address is theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Jed, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. Uh, it's great to be here. Easy on the eyes. I like that. You know, oh, man. I, I've been interrogated a few times, but an interview with Bob DeMarco, that's that's good stuff. It's great <laughs> to be here. Well, it's really good to have you here. And um, yeah, I, I first, uh, let, like I said, caught a glimpse of your work just looking for Bowie knives. I'm always looking for for uh, those in particular uh, when I'm looking for some uh, eye candy on Instagram. But then I got a chance to actually uh, meet you. This was two years ago and pick up your uh, your blades at Blade Show. And they are really awesome. Um, and and something that immediately um, caught my eyes, I mentioned up front in the intro, is how, uh, like with your coffin handle Bowie, uh, they were very much uh, taking traditional cues, but very much modern knives. Tell me, where did this love of knives originate, and how did you uh, get to develop the style? Well, I guess I've been a maker since day one, since I was a small child, like doing building things, drawing and painting, stuff like that. So that was kind of always in me, um, which I think is always in a lot of people. You just got to bring it out sometimes. But So when I was around probably five or six, I was gifted a knife that was – probably about two inches long. I think my grandparents got it in Gatlinburg one year and it was a nice knife, you know, but it was a real small, I think it was an acrylic handle and had like a pink flamingo or something on it, but it was nice. You know, I thought, well, there's gotta be more than knives than this. And so I started collecting from there and, you know, it's weird to think how your brain just clicks on certain things and why you're interested in the things you are. But, it's in a lot of us, predominantly male. A lot of us want, are just interested in knives and sharp things. And that was in me from my youth. Um, and, you know, I started collecting knives, a lot of 90s, 80s, 90s, nostalgic Pakistani knives. Hmm. I started getting into or basically any knife that I could get my hands on as a young child, probably, you know, seven, eight years old. I was all over that. Um, but I remember my dad when I would get enough uh, money for to buy a knife, there's this man down the road that would set up at a flea market and he would have this stuff set up in his shop in his garage whenever he wasn't set up at the flea market and I get enough money and we'd go out in the evening and buy a knife. And so I got a pretty nice collection of cheap junkie knives when I was a child. And that just, that's just what I enjoy doing. You know, that was it. I still made things and did things like that, but I always, enjoyed collecting the knives um and then i got into case knives not long after that you know I steered away from the cheaper knives and i was just interested in case knives and the slip joint knives um and so i think my dad bought a pawn shop around the t uh, time i was oh, cool probably nine or ten years old and um it was great because i could go up there i think they brought dropped my brother off at the YMCA 
I don't know, during the summers, drop him off there, and I would go with my dad. My mom went to work, and I go with my dad to work to the pawn shop and spend all summer up there. And I really had it made at that point in life because I could just pull a movie off the shelf and watch it or play video games if I want to play video games. And I had pretty much dibs on all the knives that came through there at that point. And um, it was a little shopping mall right outside of the Air Force Base in Columbus, Mississippi. And there was a, a guy that had a Greek restaurant. He was from Greece, but they had the vertical lamb rotisserie in there. And I could just meander on down there and he would slice them off and make me a gyro. And pretty fun time uh, memories of, of my childhood. I got to play with the guns there, all the knives. And we went to uh, yard sales every Saturday morning. And I got a nice collection of knives through doing all that, you know, I've got probably 50 or 60 case knives. I know you're a case fan. I am I'm indeed. Fine. But from then, um, I started getting into guns and my, my knife funds kind of ran low after that whenever I started doing all that. But we moved, my granddad died, I think in 99, and we moved from Mississippi up to Hornbeak, Tennessee, which was my mom's old home place, the old farm where she grew up. And there was a scrap metal pile there. And so at the age of probably 12, I know I was in sixth grade, you know, I started making, making, made my first knife. All I had was a Dremel at that point. And I sit there and just carve away a piece of metal until a knife came out and made a lot of melee weapons, stuff like that. I find old sprockets in this pile of steel and attach a stick to it. I actually have one right here. Oh, cool. So it was like a beaver stick that a beaver had chewed on and just attach a spike and the sprocket you know and that that's what i really enjoy doing at that point in my life it was just about weapons melee weapons knives from you know a fairly young age and i didn't have much starting off i had a like a bench grinder a dremel a hacksaw and a few woodworking tools didn't have a workshop my dad didn't have a workshop so it's like all this stuff I had to figure out on my own. It's like, it, you just make it work with what you have. Here's another few examples. Ooh. And that's just, a, that's just a really crude basic knife. There's no heat treat on it. It's just a piece of steel and some apple handles. No, there's another one. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever used these. I used this one to open an ammo can once. That's why it's all kind of beat up on the back. And it's got some pesos for a pommel there, you know, chunk of brass. Wow. But I did this uh, a lot, you know, made quite a few things like this, several. There's another. Oh, yeah. That's like an Iroquois, uh, Iroquois war club. Right, uh, right. And then I have spikes on them and stuff like that. See, you know, it's kind of interesting to me, Jed. Now, I, I've met you a few times at, at, at Blade Show, and we've talked on the phone, and and now, and you don't seem to me, now I could be reading you wrong, but you don't seem like a violent guy. You don't seem like a crazy guy to me. Um, and I am not, I am neither of those things either. And as you can see from the wall behind me, I've always had an interest in weapons too, not just in knives and swords, but melee weapons like you're showing there. Um, what, and you mentioned before, there's no telling what's going to click and what's going to interest you. What do you think it is? I'm just curious. Uh, I ask this sometimes when I recognize a, a kindred spirit, what is it uh, like, uh, about weapons in particular, uh, that might draw the interest of a young boy who's not in any other way, a violent person or a confrontational person? Right. Well, it's just a primal instinct, I guess, you know, a weapon for, for self-defense. A knife is one of the oldest basic tools there are. I worked maintenance for several years and carried a pair of Nipex pliers, and that was your tool. And you would use that tool all the time. Same way with the knife, you know, for everyday activities. A knife is going to come in handy for a lot of things. It's not supposed to be a screwdriver, but it, it can be a screwdriver. You're not supposed to open an ammo can with it, but you probably can open an ammo can with it. But it, I, it's just interesting. I don't consider myself like an obsessed knife dude, but I may be, you know, crazy. <laughs> I don't, maybe it's just controlled craziness or anger or whatever you said, but it's just, 
it's just in us for whatever reason. It goes way back, and maybe it was just something that was put in us. I think so. I, I think Philo- there's a uh, – yeah. I'm sorry, what were you saying? It's a philosophy question. Yeah, it is. I, I think uh, I'm boiling it down to um, self-reliance for the knife part of it. Self-reliance is what it boils down to. And then also, uh, if you have any sort of protector instinct in you, uh, it's like, well, that will help me protect my family or protect myself. As opposed to like I was asked, I was asking in terms of violence, but that, uh, you know, it's more of a protective instinct, I think. Anyway, it, you just uh, you said something interesting when you said um, you can never quite tell what's going to grab onto you. Yeah, yeah, you never know. I mean, I, like I said, people have different interests. I have several interests other than knives, but yeah, it's just something that's that's always been there. I said I'm into guns too, and I like getting a slingshot when I'm boarding the shop and shooting rocks across the road. You know, it's just it's just in there. <laughs> I don't know why. So, how did you get into machining? Well, when I was about the era of time I was making these knives, I was getting into high school and had a neighbor. And he was like, "You, John, you really need to get into tool and dial. That'd be a good profession to get in. Tool and, I'm thinking this is guys that make wrenches and they love it so much they do it until they die. Come to find out that is not what it is. Um, so I toured the high school and they were given machine shop classes there. And I, I liked it. You know, this is place where I want to be. I was wanting to do welding because of the plasma table I could cut out. You know, I had this this mindset of making weapons. And so I thought I was going to be welding until I toured the machining uh, department. It's like, no, this is where I need to be. Mm-hmm. They showed the mills and the lathes and what they could do. And so I took that for three years and um, made knives there at, at school. As a matter of fact, my teacher bought me a piece of tool steel so I could make a knife and I tried to heat treat this over an open fire, but it really didn't go well. But you can see the progression, like the, the knives I just showed you in this one, it's actually getting somewhere looking like something. It has a, you know, inlaid antler on it. It's got a fuller in it. Decent little knife for, you know, a 15, 16 year old kid. Yeah, I'll say. And, and also markedly uh, more advanced than what you were holding up before. Um, Right. That that cool antler handle uh, recurve buoy was cool, and uh, the long straight blade is cool. But uh, no doubt that dagger shows a bit of uh, advanced skill. Uh, just just for context, so people who m- might not be familiar with your work, uh, pick up something from today uh, and show that off, uh, just so we have some idea. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's where it's at today. I made a few of these before. And, you know, it's came a long way. Fit and finish is something that can always be worked on. And that's, you know, that that's where it is today. Oh, wait, wait, hold, hold on. Uh, just hold that up and put it closer to the camera. And just let's let us soak this in. So this has, drive, a, yeah, like a pistol grip handle, uh, uh, clip point blade with a double fuller on both sides. Uh, yeah, so nice. this is mini barong is basically all this is. I had made a full size barong and posted it on social media and a guy saw it and wanted one, but he said, I want something I can carry. So I scaled my barong down to this. This got a sharpened swedge on it, a few different colors of G10, dual fullers. But yeah, that this was a, a customer's request and I took his idea. And ran with it. But yes, it's came a long ways over the years, for sure. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears has gone into it. Okay, so we just saw uh, your latest work, and then you showed me uh, that, you showed us that dagger uh, that you tried to heat treat over an open flame that you made in your shop class. Tell us how you progressed from uh, taking that metal class, metal shop class, and dis- and deciding, yeah, this is where I belong. How did you progress into... Um, you know, becoming a knife maker. Well, right beside the the school where I took machine and there was a little machine shop and I started co op in my senior year and working there. And I went on to machine in college, technical college, and took that for about eight months. It was a eighteen month course, but I'd already been working in a machine shop for a while, so I kinda of blew through that. I had other things on my mind besides more school. 
after I got out of high school. But I did that and just worked at that machine shop for about six years. Went on for a few years, didn't make any knives. But I had a, a buddy that I was always talking about knives with, and we chit chat, real good friends. He's over all the time. And I told him I wanted a Bailey song with the clip on it so I could carry it. I was always intrigued by the Bailey songs. And so one day he rolled up at the house and he bought me this bench made Morpho 51. Nice. Which I was just blown away by that. You know, this is two, three hundred dollar knife. Who knows? And so in my attempt to repay him, I was working at the machine shop. I only made this dude a knife because he was just so into knives. And I was working on a it's a VS3, Haas VS3 mill, which is a, a huge CNC mill. It's like 50, 50 by 150 inches on the travel. So you could fit two small Volkswagens on there, basically on the table. But I had this tiny vice set up on the corner and during my lunch breaks, I would, you know, design knives on the computer. So, you know, working this machine shop, the, the boss would just come in and give you prints and you do everything from sawing it off the rack to machining it. If it had to be heat treat, ground, that was that was all on me. Um, welding, so learn how to do all that stuff. A lot of shops have somebody that programs, but my boss wasn't about that. We all learned how to program, and we did it all ourselves, which was great. You know, that's where all the learning comes in. And so I was going to make this guy a knife to pay him back for what he did, and so I, I drew this up. And this is what I consider like my first legit knife with actual heat treat and stuff. So did some deer hunting at the time. He did too. And I wanted to make a, a skinning knife. And this is basically, all skinning is, is cutting and pulling. So you skin, pull, skin, pull, kind of mm -hmm. like that. Um, had a gut hook on it, but drew this up and machined this out on the CNC. And it still has the heat color marks. Skinned several deer with this and actually cleaned a hog with it here about three weeks ago. I've only sharpened it twice, and this is probably a 15-year-old knife, so wow. piece of D2. It still does the job. And actually, while I was making that one, my first one, they hired a guy, because the guy ran a big lathe beside me, he was quitting. They hired a new guy, which was actually Jason Stout. Uh -huh. So this was before he was making knife full-time. Full he was doing it part-time and still machining. And so... He started working right beside me, which was for an aspiring knife maker, having Jason Stout working with you every day is it's it's pretty good stuff. Yeah. Um, and so he he taught me a lot. I never once made a knife with him, but he was gracious enough to answer the millions of questions that I had for him at the time. Um, this is another one, like the same batch of first knives that I did. I machined these bevels and like would sand them in with a die grinder. And you like this is worlds above the where the, the diagram I made in high school is it has a rattlesnake inlay on it burlap micarta handles let, let, let me stop I actually gave to the dude i made two or three of these and i kept one gave him one let, let me stop you there for a second uh okay. Two a couple of things um first of all that that uh, hunting knife is really cool because um, it features, I mean, you showed it, uh, but in case people are just listening, it features a ring at the, for the pinky. So you can cut and then let go of it, cut and let go of it. And we see that on smaller hunting knives, like bird and trout, uh, knives, but you don't usually see them on big game skinners like that. And that's, that's cool to see. I like that. Uh, um, that's a cool blending again of, of, uh, knives and styles there. Right, and you don't need a big old knife to skin, really. Like I said, I cleaned the hog with that one a few weeks ago. This is the same model that I, I put a handle on. But you, you can skin a bull moose with this knife, no joke. It's just a short, curved blade, and you really don't need a whole lot. But the finger groove is, is in so many designs these days. You see so many knives with the finger groove on it. And it's a nice feature. It comes in handy, especially for something like that. You know, it's a knife is a tool, but you're still hands-on doing things if you're cutting. So you need as many hands as you can get. And that yeah. ring for that application works really well. Yeah. And you see that ring uh, like 99% of the time in a defensive situation, a uh, defensive kind of knife, uh, right. unless, it, unless it's one of those really dainty bird and trouts. So I think adding it to a 
to that. I think it's brilliant. I think it looks cool. I'm always talking about the looks because, uh, you know, that does matter to me. But um, but on that knife, it's pure, uh, you know, um, uh, purpose. Let it, let that thing dangle so you can pull. Um, and I, I want to ask you about a machine shop. I've never um, I don't know much about uh, it's called a job machine shop, right? Like you get jobs that come in and you uh, what, yeah. what kind of what kind of stuff are you producing? And because um, you mentioned heat treat and sh and grinding also are you, like, did you make knives in that shop also or tell well, me about what you know, th this was um, a machine shop. It was beside a good year in Union City, Tennessee. And Goodyear was was our bread and butter until they went out of business. Um, but it was just basically any part that we can make that would come out of that Goodyear is what we would do. It could be anything from a full blown machine that we would paint and weld all these parts to. You could barely get it out the door to just small, small parts. And yeah, a lot of them were heat treated, and that's how, that's how we learned how to do it. That's how I learned how to do it. Okay, so I just doing heat treating stuff like that in high school, but. Yeah, so just, I mean, just parts that. for all sorts of industrial machines and and vehicles and that kind of thing. Basically, like yeah, industrial parts is cool. is mostly what it was. But yeah, just a ton of that. You wouldn't even know what the part was. It would just be a random part, and you would get it in and just make it to the specs of the print over and over again for fifty, sixty hours a week. <laughs> That's all it was. You know, you do anything for that long a week, you you should be good at it after yeah. a decade. Yeah, I hope so. So I love I love that image of a giant mill table, you know, that you could fit two Volkswagens on, uh, but you have this tiny corner and you're and you're creating your knives, and that's where it's sort of uh, getting born. How did you get serious about it? When did you discover, like, wait a sec, this is more than more than uh, just a hobby? Well, you know, I, I went from there and uh, making those knives and I thought this ain't bad and I met Jason and knew, you know, he was at least making some money. It was a hobby and he went on from there and you know where he is today. But I thought, man, I could one day this could be an occupation for me and I could get out of this vicious cycle of living for somebody else's dream, live my own dream. And so I got some machines over the time i had a, a barrett model 99 a gun very expensive gun that i didn't need at the time and put a eight by 32 night force on top of it which is expensive scope that i didn't need and i had this guy that has a machine shop he was getting rid of and he had this this mill behind me and a surface grinder and three phase converter and just different machines i needed oxyacetylene torch and i traded him the gun and scoping stuff for the machines and the tooling i closed in my garage and I just um, did what I could do at home for the first uh, several knives after the ones I showed you. I would do what I could at home. I got a little grizzly belt sander and I would do other stuff at work. Like I didn't have a mill, well, probably before this time. So several of these I would carry to work and heat treat, didn't have an oven. And that, that got old after a while because it's hard to do very much when you're having to work on your lunch break at work. And, stuff like that. So that's when I tried to furnish a shop and get the tools and equipment I needed. And it was a strictly a hobby for probably 10 or 15 years. Mm. And I filled some orders and stuff like that. Nothing very serious, but I just tried to work on my craft over that time and make a lot of different models. Just try not to get stuck on one thing very long and just try different things. You know, I had to teach myself leather, Kydex and just fit and finish on the knives um it, it was a lot to do from there and so i i got this shop and i did a few youtube videos and i think i may have taken them down now but i got into youtube and that's where i met scab and donnie b all day and cowboy seabop um another youtube knife reviewer sensation yeah. and so that's where my my association with them came along at well those those guys are all uh big knife um big knife big fixed blade collectors and users and they on their channel they're the ones uh up front i was talking about who um have used your knives and taken them through their paces uh doing things that most of us don't ever do with our knives and i love that uh to me that's a that's a service uh because i collect knives and i spend a lot of my 
time and money acquiring certain knives. And uh, I tend to be the kind of collector who, who's somewhat precious with them. I mean, I like to use them, but I, uh, at the same time, it's nice to see have other people who are out there uh, ch chopping two by fours and cutting tires and throwing them into stumps and that kind of thing uh, so that I don't have to. Uh, Absolutely. But, but what is so impressive is how uh, the knives, uh, uh, your knives have performed in those videos. And I'm thinking mostly of Scab and actually Donnie B all day. Uh, who who does put some through the ringer too? Um, what before you had people that you were connected with like that? How how would you test your knives, or how do you still test your knives these days uh, once you finish them? Well, kind of like a lot like Scab does. I'll, I'll you know I kind of know where the geometry needs to be and the heat treat. You know if that's done done a certain way, then it's gonna come out where it needs to be. But like. Last time I did one, I found a knotty piece of oak that I burned in the in the house. Got a wood burning stove and just smack away, or find a piece of brass that really test your edge and just start smacking away, and you'll know you know where it fails and where it stands up and where it don't. Uh, that'll tell you an awful lot. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to test them. Some of the steel will hold up. I've chopped steel with steel. I use a lot of three V, and I've bashed steel with it and it's it's held up really well a lot of that comes down to your edge geometry and the, i mean every every maker should be testing their knives they should be taking them out like one that you just don't like or that's what i mean some of mine don't turn out right i'm not gonna sell them and so i won't take it and see what the steel will do that's but yeah i cringe every time i watch you know scav's videos because you know this is this is something i made and spent a lot of time on and he's giving it all he's got and i just think it's great Oh, you got to be very proud to see how they perform, though. Oh, this one right here, while we're on it, since Jim pulled it up, the Hero Bowie. Oh, my God, this is so beautiful. And this is a great example of taking design cues from, in this case, uh, the K-Bar to me, but totally blending in uh, different aspects of of the Bowie knife, like with the, with the horse hoof, not the horse hoof pommel, but the bird's beak pommel in the back. And um, so it, it's... It, at the with the fuller and the swedge and oh my god this thing is awesome but what i'm trying to say is it's evocative of the k-bar but it's so much more um right. it's so much more it has my spin on i guess you could say but this was a collab i did for uh cowboy Seabop that i just mentioned he's on youtube oh. i think he's actually rebranded his channel to ktv kind of like mtv but ktv but i got with him a few years ago and this was actually roughly based off the anaconda but he wanted something like that but different i think this is a little bit bigger the guard's different and the, the shape is different but this was you know he didn't make it collab with him but this was his his baby his vision this is what he wanted man and so this is what we came up with i made four of these and you know th this gets a lot of attention because it's just a big nasty heavy booty 5160, you know, it's, it's got some great spring steel on it. Uh, Cowboy C. Bob, I've, I've watched a bunch of his videos too. Hats off to you. That's a beautiful design. And of course, uh, hats off to you, Jed, for put, making it. But uh, that one to me, <clears throat> your coffin handle buoy, uh, the, uh, they have, uh, or, or the Boudreaux, that's one that I was very close to buying. Uh, I just didn't quite have the fundage uh, by the time I saw it. Uh, but that's the uh, your your really unique, uniquely ground push dagger. Um, all of these things, again, uh, you know, hearkening back to old designs, but putting a modern twist on them. Um, and there's that coffin uh, handle buoy right there in the middle. Um, so tell me about uh, uh, does the design evolve from the testing? Uh, does the testing um, come after the de the design. Uh, what I'm interested in is looking at your current designs here. How did how did you get to this? The Kermit, the double edged uh, Kermit there uh, that looks like a sax, uh, not a sax, but a, a gladius. <laughs> this is a lot of very unique stuff happening. Tell me about your designing. It's all different, you know. I can get inspiration from just about anywhere. Kermit came from, I think, the show Muppet Babies. You know, I got four kids. And they <laughs> They watch a lot. I've seen a lot of Disney movies. I'm a Disney movie buff, but yeah. not not by choice. Um, 
but you know kermit this little uh kid kermit he's a toddler but he carries his sword and it's not shaped exactly like this kermit but you know i saw that and that's where the name came from from that the name was after the zyme sometimes I'll have a name before the design, but uh, I've had dreams before, like just dreaming a knife and get up and draw it, you know, half awake in the morning. I've seen, I built a knife for, um, well, built it and Joe from Jazz Bladecraft bought it. And that was when I was working down at a hog barn one day at work. And this tarp was laid over the hog barn and light was coming through it. And it, it looked kind of like a Tonto shaped knife, you know, and thought, well, it, really anywhere inspiration can come from anywhere a lot of it's just stuff in my head it's, it's my imagination and that's really all i have to offer is stuff that that pops up in my head that i'm interested in and other people find it interesting as well um you mentioned the coffin handle buoy that's just the old tried and true tested handle shape really this is one that i made like my first year of machining and i was probably 18 19 years old and i got my machine going and i would go back and i uh, saw this up and started grinding on it and never finished it i had this chunk of steel laying around in this shape coffin handle shape for several years and i finished this right before blade show when we met here a couple of years ago oh, wow but it, i i like the way that the coffin handle you have your hand indexes right there if you make a grip it's not going this way and it's not going this way because it's it's basically locked in place and plus you have a pommel there that you can strike with and i also like the symmetry like a lot of my knives i try to make symmetrical handles a lot of them the design don't dictate that but even though you're only been cutting with it one way it's a one well this one it, it's a double edged knife so you can basically hold this in either direction the handle is going to feel the same and you can cut either way you know it really don't make no difference but i, I do like the coffin handle very much Perfect for uh, Bowie knife fighting because oftentimes you're flipping it over and using the swedge as your primary striking surface and then using the, uh, uh, you know, that, what do they call it? The Randall fighting method where you, you sort of thrust and heave ho over your shoulder for the blade part, but you're using the swedge to break, to defang the snake, break the hand, do all that kind of stuff that, that cool Bowie knife stuff. I, I, I love it. Absolutely. You just feel more like a man with a booty knife. <laughs> I, I agree. I, maybe nobody else wants to say that, but I want to hear that. You heard it well, first on Junkie Podcast. You, uh, on, on your uh, site, you also have size. You, you made some SAI, -S SAI, uh, right? With the, the, right, right. right. Oh, the, uh, the, one of the Ninja Turtles used them. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. Yeah, it was a Raphael. Yeah, the red one, the, the angry one. <laughs> but this is something that popped in my mind. You know, I thought a, a knife, a knife size, something that you can use. It's not just for poking because it'll, it'll cut too. But the, the tangs on this are sharp as well. And this was designed to be an EDC uh, self-defense knife. Like this would, this would do great for that. It's kind of small and compact. It's not just a super long knife. But yeah, I think there was a uh, Mortal Kombat or something. There was a character. And they're one of the female characters that had a knife saw. And, you know, like I say, it just pops in your head one day and you're like, I like that. And I've got let, to make that. And let so, me see the sheath for that. I'm curious what, what it looks like. Oh, wow. That that's very. See, I was thinking, like, how would I how would I wear that and carry that in the waistband? But but the way it's not f those guards aren't fully enclosed all the way around keeps that sheath nice and slim you could totally edc that knife yeah this isn't much larger than you know because it's it's thin here and the rivets are they're they're in pretty close but it's not a real wide knife as much as you might think with the, with the codex what? there i mean it okay so it, it in general it would be a huge flex to be just edcing one of your fixed blades anyway but to pull out a sigh like who's gonna like what <laughs> yeah it's a little bit different you know that's, yeah. that's what I try to achieve uh, building, design a knife is something a little bit different. I have a lot of people come up to me and want me to do a custom knife, like something they've drawn. And it's like, I try to back away from that because yep. for one, it's not my design. And it's, I want, I want the process of my knives to come from my mind through my hands. And that be, be all me basically is what I want. 
it's something a little bit different. You know, some of these aren't probably not for everybody. Like they're, they're just not basic knives in, in design. They're some of them are kind of out there and they're not just so far out there, but they're still simple things, but just a little bit different. Well, uh, it begs the question, cause you were talking before about your love of slip joints. Uh, and, uh, so would you make folders or slip joints or something that is, um, you know, not everyone can uh, walk around with a fixed blade, but everyone can throw a folder on them somewhere. Is this something you've considered? Absolutely. Yeah, I have some designs in the works right now, as a matter of fact. And I've built a prototype folder before and learned a lot doing that. But yeah, definitely. You know, I'm just getting started as far as knife making goes full time. So yeah, that's in the work, Bob. We're going to see that. Hopefully, all right. Uh, in the next few months, uh, if all goes well. But I'm, I'm in total agreement. Like I'd soon carry a, a folder knife because a lot of times don't dictate really a, a fixed blade knife. If you're walking through the grocery store carrying a, you know, 12, 13 inch long Bowie knife on you. Well, not that, but the size that you had uh, that you were just showing, I can't remember the name that you said, but those size, Cer say that again, sorry. Cerberus, the three headed beast. The oh, oh, the world. Yeah. The, the Cerberus, you could totally EDC that. Uh, and th there's another one that you make that I, I really hope you have one close by because I'd love to see it, is the Necromance. Do you have one oh. of those? So to me, this this is uh, this will be, I think, would be my first Jed Hornbeak knife. This thing is so beautiful, but also just like a nice fighting knife EDC. T tell me so about it. This was designed to be a stabbing knife you can tell it's got a modified pistol grip on it basically and this would be the trigger or this would act just like a sub hilt to keep your yep. finger there locked in position it's got jumping on the back it's got a scandy grind swage a hollow grind it's meant for poking i mean this is this is a straight up self-defense knife that you could edc you can still open up boxes with this you can you know open up your cereal bag whatever you wanted to but it's made for stabbing, you know, that's what, that's what this is. And that's what it would excel at because it's, it's double edged. It's got the grip for it. It's staying in the hand, you know, you know, alley at night, low light situation. You can pull this out and, you know, nobody's going to grab at you. You, you've got some distance there uh, right off the bat because you have a double edged weapon. And even if you're just, you know, backing up, trying to get somebody off of you, you still got, you still got a nice point there on you. So that's that's what that was designed to do. Oh yeah, I'm a huge fan of that design. And now seeing it moving around in three dimensions, uh yeah, that's that's uh, that's uh definitely one uh to save for. Uh that's a beauty. And I say save for uh because you make custom knives. You, they're not inexpensive knives, but they're also not crazy expensive. They're not uh you know, I, I think pricing what you make is a difficult thing. I think no matter what you're making, you got to look at what others are doing, uh, what other knives are costing, what the waters are that you're swimming in, so to speak. But you also have to think about your time and your expenses and also uh, being able to reinvest in your own business and and move forward. Tell me a little bit about that, the business side of things. Uh, what, are, what are you discovering? What have you discovered in uh, uh, leading a small business in knives? I discovered that it's pretty expensive to build a knife, like you were talking about. There, there's a lot goes into this. And um, for one, the machines, you know, everything here behind me costs an arm and leg. I had to trade off all my good guns for this stuff. And <laughs> You know, I bought in the last year, I spent 10 or 12 grand on laser engraver, tumbler, and harness tester. All this stuff is just so, it's like the steel, some of these knives I'll have over $100 in. Um, the steel is so expensive. I uh, do a lot of CPM steels. There's a lot of high end steels. This stuff ain't cheap. The belts are so expensive. Um, I need a belt company to sponsor me, by the way. Uh, you hear that on the Bob DeMarco podcast. <laughs> And the belts are expensive. It costs a lot to run the heat treat oven. So selling off for two hundred dollars, just you know, I can't do it. I can just can't. And I don't imagine many USA makers can, or, you yeah. know, for the same style of knife that I'm going for. But then again, you, you try to keep your prices. I do. I'm starting off, so I'm trying to keep them low as possible to to sell 
I need to move some knives, really. You know, this is what I'm doing. This is how I put bread on the table. So I need to move some knives. And I don't want to make just an obscene price, but a price where I can make a few bucks and, and move some knives is what I'm doing there. But, yeah, the business side is, is different. Making knives is easy, but, but running a business is a whole nother layer of, of stress is there. But it's it's gone real well. Like, since January, we got the website going and have sold uh, – I don't know, probably 70% of the knives that were on there. And so it, it's picking up. It really is picking up. But, yeah, there's a lot to run in the business. But it's it's nice, you know. Like, I'm the man now. I talked about working several years in a machine shop and just – you're living for somebody else's dream. There's the owner. He, he's giving you enough just to keep you there. But, you know, he's doing whatever he does, and that's, that's how businesses work. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. But it just got to a point, it's like I'm making all these parts. I don't even know what the part is. I'm working all these long hours. I'm sacrificing time with my family, working every Saturday up in this joker, you know, and this just ain't for me. It's not for me. Um, and so I, I got these machines. Like someday I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to do this if I can because I want to be the man. I'm tired of working for somebody else and just yep. being on their schedule, doing something you don't want to do all day long. So I'm blessed to have the jobs that I did. And I learned so much about working in the three shops that I was at. And that was great. Those jobs, uh, your jobs, my jobs, you know, the jobs that you have, especially the ones where you're like, ah, you know, they're very valuable because, uh, they teach you, uh, what it's like to be, um, uh, you know, responsible for someone else's time or responsible during someone else's time and uh, responsible with their things and be. So basically being in those jobs teaches you how to be a, a good boss in a way, uh, because you learn what you don't want uh, to do. You can also learn uh, what you can offer other people. If they're moving through, if you start hiring, uh, you know that after you learned your skills and you got those skills down. Everything after that is piecework. You're just making widgets over and over and over. Uh, you mastered that, and it was time to take it somewhere else and put your own creativity to it. And, right, right. And, so, and that's what why those jobs are necessary. I, I feel absolutely. You know, there's there's a machining aspect and and, and just everything around us. It started off at, at a machine shop, but I went from there and I started doing maintenance, industrial maintenance, because I wanted to learn new skills. I was just kind of tired of the the long hours of machine shop, basically. So I started doing maintenance and and learned that, and it was great. Did that for a few years. And um, September of 22, I just made a hard, fast decision to quit my job. I had a situation where I really needed to work from home, and so I had all this stuff set up. I was like, "Well, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to step out and do this. I got two options: I'm going to make enough making work, or I'm going to make enough making work. One or the other." And so that's, that's basically what happened. Okay. Uh, Jim is scrolling through your Instagram and there's a knife. I want to see uh, if you have, this is a very unique one. I got to check out uh, at blade show your Rhodesian model of the, what is that? The, the Kermit Rhodesian. Kermit Rhodesian. Can you show that? <clears throat> this is uh, one of the craziest knives and, yeah. If someone pulled this out of me, I would run the so fast in the other direction. Right, right. So the Kermit started off as I made four of them, and I have four different models now. But it, it was a smaller knife. This is this is what it started at, and this is the Kermit Rhodesian. But I wanted a small self defense knife, EDC self defense knife. This is what I, I make a lot of basically. But I wanted something that could be held in the hand four different directions and the grip would be the same. Maybe you're in a low light situation, you drop your knife and you pick it up, you can pick it up and it's going to cut either direction because all of them are, are double edge. This one is serrated. The Kermit Rhodesian. So that, that was one of them. Did a snake skin inlay on that sheath. This was the Kermit Hornet. Again, same handle and and double edged, and so I, I made four of those, and I went on and thought, well, that that's a nice knife, but maybe something a little bit combat size would be better for some people. And so, 
This is the full size Kermit Rhodesian. Wow. And this is chisel ground. Got serrations on the back. Same handle symmetry, geometry, and all that. Wait, wait, wait. Hold that back up. <laughs> Not so fast. <laughs> this blade is so unique. You've got, uh, I'm going to start from the top. You've got a, th a long thumb ramp, kind of like a bayonet grind, uh, grind thumb ramp. Uh, directly below it, a fuller, and then you have this wicked run of serrations that terminates in a small, flat, sharp, and then a, a clip that's fully sharp, and then like a tanto blade. You got like four edges on this thing. It's a lot to look at. You remember the first Mission Impossible movie where he goes in and he's, you know, on this wire and he's going down to this room and sweats dropping off of him and stuff. And yeah. The, he pulls out a knife with the same basic clip of that you know similar not exactly you know i saw that movie probably 20 years ago and and that's been sticking with me ever since it's just i saw this this one small blade shape and you know it comes back around and i use that on this knife nice and sturdy point on that but yeah inspiration from everywhere that is the kermit there is um Let's see, I think I have another one. That... So you you put an oh god, that's this cool. is the Kermit, just just the straight up Kermit. But see, it's got the same handle, all has the same handle, yeah. and they're all double edged. This one is just like a gladius sword, pretty much. It's got the fuller down it, serrations on one side. Made I've sold a few of these, but um, they've actually sold real well. All four of them. All four so models. it sounds like that went into Kydex and the last one too, but then you hold it up. Okay, this one looks like Kydex. Do you wrap some of them in leather also? Did I hear? Yeah, yeah. So this one, okay. this one had leather sheathed on it. And I did some with Kydex. It's basically whatever mood I'm in at the time is okay. is what I'll do. Um, and next time it may be different. I may do leather on these and you know, some people hit me up and they want something done a certain way. I, like I said, I don't do many customs, but, you know, I can tailor my knife to how they want it as far as that goes. So now who who's buying your knives and, and what are you hearing from the field? Um, I've had knives that I've given to buddies and stuff that carry them every day and just love it and show them off to people. I've you know, a lot of customers from the website that have, bought multiple knives they'll they'll buy several knives and they'll lay it out on their carpet at the house and, and send me a picture of their whole jet hornbeak collection um that's cool but that's what i want you know these design uh, they're designed to be used they're heat treated to try to use premium ingredients in there and so they're they're meant to be used a day in and day out if that's what somebody wishes to do so uh as a company jet hornbeak knives um if you were to look into the future, do you want to become the kind of knife company that has a lot of different models that you're making at one or offering at once? Or do you kind of uh, want to have a knife, run it for a while, discontinue it and, and do something new? Are, are you going to amass a large uh, uh, stable of models? Yeah, but I mean, that's what I'm doing now. And I've sold out of several of them but they'll come back around. But when they come okay. back around, it may be a while from now because it, it, it's a planning process really. Cause uh, you got to order the steel, send it to a water jet guy, cut it out, order belts, hand the materials or leather, all this stuff. And it just comes in, you keep ordering it. And so like a knife that I may just sold out of, it may be six months down the road before I have a chance to make it again, because there are so many other ones in front of it that are in the works. Right. Basically. Right. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. Cause I hate to hear when something I love is retired, like, Oh, I'm not making that design anymore. It's like, why not? <laughs> I haven't gotten that one yet, but uh, I, like, like the Boudreaux, I would love to get at some point. Um, but first it's gotta be a necromance. Just seeing that. Can you pick yeah, that yeah. up again? I just want to see that again. If okay. you don't mind just for my own personal edification here. I know about a lot of things like chips at Walmart, you know, if I start liking it, then they're going to quit carrying it. And that's yeah. The the way it is and it's, it's kind of disheartening like that yeah yeah so i made three of these and this was um a design that i, I recently did um and that the other two are sold 
Mm. It's just a sweet little piece. I'm glad you like that, Bob. Yeah, I do. Uh, how long is that blade, would you say? About four and a half inches? Yeah, probably four and a quarter, four and a half, something four like and a quarter. that. That's perfect. Perfect for the perfect for the purpose. Um, so uh, you mentioned that you're not so hot on the idea of making um, making a knife to someone's collect uh, like specs. But what about collaborations uh, where you're working with another knife maker or designer and you're kind of going back and forth? Have you ever done that? I have uh, not with another knife maker, no. Um, and I'd be open to that. I just hadn't chance, hadn't crossed my path yet. But I've worked with uh, different YouTubers uh, like Scab. He's got yeah. the Farboy's Cap Knife. And that was something that he was inspired by, I think, Captain Electro or somebody, Captain Electro designed a knife and made a knife and scab wanted something similar to that. And so we came up with something and made it. I've worked with Donnie before. Um, some knives that he's designed, uh, actually the second knife, I'm making another batch right now of a knife that he designed. And so, you know, I like Donnie's designs. He's got nice, nice designs. And that's basically about it. Take somebody's designs. It's going to have to be something that I like, you know, a lot of people will come up to me with a design and want things done a certain way. And some things I, I, I do things my own way yeah. and I don't want to be limited. You know, creativity is stifled by other people's designs that are, you know, so solid to that. There's no compromise. And that's what I try to steer away from. But yes, I'm, I'm open and willing to working with other makers as far as that goes. And I have built other designs. I, I think that if I were a knife maker, I would I would have I would prefer that approach um, rather than a, a taking orders and having books and 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 and, and like, oh, my God, I, I got to make another one of these. But this time with a red handle and now I got to make another um, to me and my attention span. I think I think uh, I think I would be more apt to do it uh, the way you're suggesting. Um, right. But but then always having. um always having those patterns um, somewhere ready to reemerge at some point when you're ready to do another run. Um, typically like how long, how large would you say your runs are when you, when you do a knife, does it just depend on, on the demand for that one in particular or, um, or how does that work for you? It depends. I try to do them like not even 10 or 12, but like five or six small batches stuff that, and I typically don't do this, but I mean, I could finish maybe five knives in a week if it was a certain model and go through the week as a whole process and be done with, uh, with the knives at the end of the week. But like for heat treating and stuff, I got to buy liquid nitrogen. So I try to heat treat a big batch at one time and just work on that batch of heat treated blades and finish them out like that. As far All right. As Jed, my, my eyes keep drifting over your right shoulder to that, to that, that belt filled with cruciform blades there. Let, let's talk about that for a quick sec. And so in the pawn shop, I watched this movie, uh, Desperado and Danny Trejo comes out. He's an assassin. And actually the per people that were killing him was, was, the, was on the same side, but they didn't. Anyways, he comes out and he wrecks Steve's machine. You know, the knife goes about two inches in, in Steve and he dies like that quick on the spot. But Danny comes out, there's this um, armored car. They got Desert Eagles hanging out the window, shooting at him, you know, 500 rounds. And he comes out, and he's got, I think, 15 or 16 of these. And he wrecks four, five, six people. He climbs on top of it, and he's throwing knives down in there <laughs> before he finally gets shot and killed. But that, that image of this movie, I didn't even finish the whole movie. From when I was 12 or 13 years old, it's been seared in my mind so hard all this time. And I thought one day... I'm going to have me a belt like old Danny Trejo. And so that's what I did. I, I finished these up and actually finished the belt up on the way to Blade Show when we met uh, you know, on the seven-hour drive down there. But it's nice, man. It's nice. I got to figure out how to Yeah. Finish. I'll quit carrying a gun at that point because I won't. <laughs> well, I was thinking the the cool thing about uh, a project like that, first of all, you know, it's just – it's something that you can do for yourself uh, – it's probably something you've always wanted, but you can actually build it for yourself, which I think is so cool because, you know, I have so many different projects like that that I would do if I could uh, build them. But I, I think that's neat. But something that is especially cool is the is the reproducibility, the high fidelity 
reproduction one after the other of doing things on a mill. Just looking at all of those knives on that belt, they're probably all exactly the same. Um, and that that is one of the really uh, beauty parts of making knives uh, the way you do. How, how important is that to you to have uh, all of the representatives, all the specimens of one model that you're making be the same? I mean that that's all machining is. You get a you get a print and uh, it'll have a part quantity on there and you make however many it is. This is this is what I've done my whole career basically is repeat the same part over and over. Um to a degree where they all the same. They're all in spec, then they're all the same. I did this on the manual mill and you just set up on a jig or clamp this in the vise and do that same cut on all of them and just keep putting them in the vise until you know they all look the same, all like you want them. And that's, it's, it's all in the machine. A lot of it, if like CNC stuff, it's all just a, a press of the button. It's going to make the same part every single time. It's a beautiful thing, really. It really is. Uh, I'm sure you had a million people asking to buy that. I had some people interested in it, but no, and as far as buying it, no, I took it oh, off. Okay. It's hard to go to the bathroom with, with <laughs> where the knife belt. Yeah, but it could be a dangerous prospect too. You want to make sure that absolutely, absolutely <laughs> those leather uh, tabs there hold. Uh, so, uh, what do you what do you see for the future of Jed Hornbeak knives? Uh, are you going to hire people? Is that something you could do? Could you entrust anyone to your knives? Uh, tell us what what how you see this company uh, in the future. Well, I think the only predictable thing about the future is its unpredictability, and I think I heard that on Rat Truth. Sure. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not interested in hiring anybody. I like coming out here and meandering out here in the morning uh, early with a cup of coffee and doing what I want to do. I don't want to have to babysit nobody. I don't want to have to worry about hiring and, and payroll and all that. And I want to keep it simple on myself. And, you know, I'd rather work by myself. So I just keep doing what I'm doing. It would be nice to have a CNC machine at some point. That would be, I think, the next step up for me because I'd really be in my element with a CNC because that's what I've done my whole career. Just set up, run, program CNC, and that would be great. That would be a nice future addition to Jed Hornbeak knives. Um, but for right now, just keep making knives, keep designing knives. I got knife designs for days. And so I just keep doing those and hopefully keep on making what people like. And there's a time when I make stuff that people don't like, I may have to find something else to do, but until then, <laughs> Just keep on riding this this wave. Well, the cool thing is, is that the knives that you're making on the manual mill over your shoulder uh, will someday, uh, you know, when you do get that CNC machine, those will jump in value as you know the the um, the early days or or the the pre CNC days, and it'll add a dimension to your collect the the collectability of your work. Um, but as it is, as it stands, I know that your work is very collectible and, and very um, uh, desirable and coveted. And I, I know that I myself am, am now, not now, but uh, just through the enthusiasm of some of the other people who brought me in and now having this conversation with you and, and looking at your work. Uh, um, I'm very excited for you and I'm very excited to get my hands on one of your knives and uh, add it to my collection for sure. And, uh, you know, like I said, you know which one I want, cause I want to be able to carry it every day. Uh, I'd love to have that coffin handle or the, uh, hero, but with my lifestyle, that can't be the first one because I have to be able to carry around the first one. Hey, I understand that hundred percent. We'll have to hook you up, Bob. We can do this. We'll make oh, this we will. Uh, this is not me begging on camera. This is oh, just saying, don't get rid of that one. Jed, uh, I hate, hate to hit you uh, mid-sip there, but I just want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a real pleasure. Has it already uh, been an hour, Bob? That, that was talking, great. Yeah, it's been an hour. Uh, but you and I are going to talk for another few minutes for the patrons. So uh, anyone who's a member of Patreon can hear a little bit more with me and Jed. But it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for showing off your gorgeous knives, and uh, best of luck to you, sir. Thank you so much, Bob. It was my pleasure. Take care. The Shockwave Tactical Torch is your ultimate self-defense companion, featuring a powerful LED bulb that lasts 100,000 hours, a super sharp crenulated bezel, and built-in stun gun delivering 4.5 million volts.
Don't settle for ordinary. Choose the Shockwave Tactical Torch. TheKnifeJunkie.com slash Shockwave. You can cook your bratwurst with it. I have one. It's super powerful and very cool. All right. There goes Jed Hornbeak, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much to Jed for joining us. And uh, I'm so uh, happy to meet him. I'm so glad I got a chance to actually pick up and heft his knives at Blade Show. You know, I was talking about how I wanted a push dagger. Well, I found his push dagger a little bit too late. Unfortunately, uh, all my money was spent at that point. But in any case, uh, be sure to go check out Jed Hornbeak on Instagram, and you can also uh, search him on YouTube and find uh, uh, many of our trusted voices uh, showing off and using his knives. Uh, be sure to check in with us on Wednesday for the Midweek Supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives. That's at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.